You know, we want to all become successful, but I've found that there's some success that's toxic success. What I mean is that you don't want to end up going after goals and dreams and neglect yourself. I want you to think about your goals and dreams and things that you want to achieve. And at the top of the list, I want you to put up there your strategy for being here. I just came from the doctor. Let me share something with you. I don't care what goals and dreams that you have. You've got to have your health in order to be here. So at the top of my list, and I'm suggesting you put it at the top of your list, your strategy, your game plan for being here. What are you going to do to take better care of yourself? That's one of the first things I want to ask you about. Because when I look at my life at 64, and I used to think people in their 50s were old, but now that I'm 64, I said, look here, people in their 80s and 90s, they're old people. My goal is to be here not only just to see my grandchildren, but to see my great-grandchildren and my great-great-great-grandchildren. But in order to be here, that's not just lip service. That's a commitment with my time, with my energy, and the choices that I make. So I want you to think about your strategy for being here, and I want you to think about your goal. Your goal for securing your life in your future. See, as I get older, my goal right now is to become an asset to my children rather than a liability, financially and physically. See, I don't want to be a burden to my children. I, I don't even know if they like me that well. <laughs> I love my mama. My goal and dream was to take care of my mother. I did that. I bought her a home. I took care of her until she's 89. But children, they're different today. These are different type of people up in here. You don't know what this generation might do. Now, I know they say, Darren, we love you, but I really, really want to stay in good shape and take care of myself because I don't want to be around the house and, and my kids say, look here, who's going to take care of me today? All he's doing is sit around talking to himself, talking about, yes, I can, and yes, I will, talking out of his head. No, I don't want that kind of party for me. My goal and objective is to die young at an old age. So I have a game plan. I, I don't like to eat vegetables all the time, but now I feel like a silly wabbit. <laughs> Why? Because I realize at this stage of my life, I've got to eat more vegetables. I've got to get more rest. I've got to drink more juices. And I've got to do all of the things that make the healthy choices that will say to my body, less you plan to be here, I see that you're serious, so I'm going to take care of you. I do 160 push-ups every morning non-stop. Why? I couldn't do that at 15 or 20. But at this stage of my life, I've got to do those kinds of things in order to challenge my body, to stretch my body, and to indicate I plan to be here. What's your plan? What's your goal? Because if you don't have a goal for being here, being here is not a given. When I was a kid, we used to go to funerals of old people. I can't tell you how many young people whose funerals I've gone to. I can't tell you how many. And so, and, and there's something about between 40 and 60. I don't know what it is about that period in time. Between 40 and 60, when you, if you're approaching 40, I can tell you, you already know, life begins to intensify. Things happen to you, and things happen to people you care about. Between 40 and 60, if you can make it through that period, you can take a deep breath because most people don't make 60. Most people don't. And why? And I think it's because people just take it for granted that they're going to be here. So I want to share with you some goals and strategies that you think about your goals. I want you to visualize yourself having optimal health. I'm having your right mind. I used to ask my mama, Mama, every Sunday you stand up in church and other older members of the church say, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. Why do y'all say that all the time? She said, don't worry, son. You live long enough? You'll find out she was absolutely right. I went in the room the other day to find something. I got in there, and I couldn't remember what I was looking for. I came out. I remembered what I was looking for. I went back in. I found it. Then I couldn't remember what I was looking for. One of my children said, Daddy, you need some ginkgo biloba. I said, what's that? She said, something for your memory. I went down to the health food store. I was walking around. The lady said, may I help you, sir? I said, I forgot why I'm here. She said, you need something for your memory. I said, I know. So they took me over to a little section, and I bought the stuff, and then I took it home. Now, I can't remember where I put it. So when I got up this morning, I said, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. See, if you woke up in your right mind this morning, that's a good thing. I called a friend of mine the other day, Miss Williams. said, Miss Williams, how you doing? She said, baby, I'm doing good. She said, I went to the bathroom by myself. Not all myself. I said, too much information, too much information. Let me tell you something. But well, that's a good thing. I know about that. I've been in the hospital. 
I know what it is not to be able to move. I know what it is to have back challenges. I know what it is to be in pain. So this thing called life, you've got your health. Let me share something with you. That's a good thing. A friend of mine, Bishop T.D. Jake said, if you got a problem, man or money can solve, you ain't got no problem. I can agree with that. And I learned some things going through that experience. And really, I should say, growing through that experience. My goal at that time was to be here. Trust me, it's better be seen than to be viewed. Are you feeling the brother? Up in here, up in here. So I want you to think about your goals and dreams. And here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to say to yourself, it's possible. It's possible. And I want you to follow along with this process. As you think about your goals and dreams, I want you to write this down. I'm going to give you some strategies of maintaining this possibility mindset. I want you to write down mindset maintenance. Mindset maintenance. Let me share something with you. The easiest thing that I do every year is to live my dream. That is helping people to realize their potential, to step into their greatness, challenging themselves, reinventing themselves, to start their own businesses. I've helped over 400 people earn millions of dollars. The easiest thing I do every year is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, going into prisons and juvenile detention centers, teaching young people mindset development, how to become effective communicators, how to dress like a prospect rather than a suspect. Those are the easy things that I do. Let me share with you the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life, and that was to believe that I could do it. That's the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my entire life. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida, with a twin brother, we were adopted, we were six weeks of age by Mrs. Mamie Brown, and I called myself Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. All that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said, God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was labeled educable mental retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, fail again when I was in the eighth grade to believe that I had the ability to live the life that I'm now living. No one could have told anybody who knew me, including myself, looking in on us when Mrs. Mamie Brown was raising us in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City in Overtown, that I would be who I am right now. I didn't even know that. And I want you to think about your goals and dreams, and I want you to expand them. Why? Because it has been said that most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss, no. Most people fail in life because they're just like I was for 14 years. They aim too low and hit, and many never aim at all, not at all. They just go through life surviving. Someone said that many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65. I was talking to a friend of mine named Rosia, and I said, Rosia, how are you doing? And she said, let me tell you something. Life is a mess. I said, girl, what are you talking about? She said, my life is a mess. She said, you know what? She said, I just was sitting up here thinking, I haven't lived. I haven't lived. She said, I've been working hard all my life, paying bills and taking care of my children. And my children are gone. And I've just been thinking, I haven't done anything. She said, when I die, I don't want when people view my body. I don't want them to say, oh, she had a funny expression on her face. <laughs> I said, what do you mean by that? I don't want to have an expression that I'm mad. Because if I died right now, I would be mad. I said, why? What are some of the things you'd like to do? She said, travel. I would love to travel. I'd like to see the pyramids. I've never been to Paris. I want to go to Paris. I've never been there. There are things that I want to see, things I want to do. She said, I want to make a difference in young girls' lives, teenage mothers. I was a teenage mother. I want to be able to make a difference in their lives and see the impact that I had on their lives. And she learned, she, she mentioned a variety of things. And I, I remember a story about a lady who went to the doctor and she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she came home and she was sitting at the table and, and she was drinking some coffee and all of a sudden, she, she just looked up and, and she said, I refuse to die an unlived life. I refuse to die an unlived life. And she decided that she was going to live. That up to that point, her life was for her family, for her children, for her husband. But she, she had left herself out of the equation. Have you ever done that? I, I remember at a period in my life, I was going to work and I was working on a job that I hated. And at the same time, I was praying that I wouldn't get fired. I was praying that I wasn't laid off. I was miserable. Nobody was holding a gun to my head. 
but I showed up every day and I used a flimsy excuse. Well, I got to pay the bills. I've got a car payment I have to pay. I have a family, I have children, I have a, a car note, and I have a mortgage note I have to pay. I've got to survive. I was showing up for a paycheck. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not living. And a friend of mine said, you know when people change? And I said, no. He said, when they get to the point when they say, I've had it. I've had it. I think the only reason that you're listening to me right now, the only reason that you're watching this webinar, that there's somewhere in your heart of hearts that you said, as you looked at your life, you said, I've had it. And not only have you said, I've had it, but you said also in your heart of hearts, I can do better than this. And let me share something with you. You can. Because if anybody told me, and I'm, I'm going to share some things with you that I've done, not for the purpose to impress you, but to impress upon you what the possibilities are when you work on your mind and have mindset development. Because I've found that how people live their lives is a result of their state of mind. It has been said, you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. So part of the process, number one, is expose yourself to positive messages. See, what I'm doing right now, I'm distracting the story that's going on in your head right now. How you live your life, how I live my life, how all of us live our lives is a result of the story we believe about ourselves. And most of us are born into stories. I was born into a story where we were poor, but we didn't know it. I didn't know we were poor until I got on a bus with my mother going to do domestic work on Miami Beach. And when we crossed the Venetian Causeway and I saw those big, beautiful hotels, and I was in the homes with my mother making up beds and cleaning and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. And we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. And I kept saying, Mama, what is it, boy? As we got ready to pack up to go back home and to Overtown and Liberty City and all the poverty and filth and the violence there, I said, why can't we stay here? Why can't we stay here? She said, Leslie, we can't. Why? Because we can't. Why, Mama? Why can't we? She said, it's just the way it is. Now shut up. And I kept saying to myself, why is that the way that it is? And I guess I was okay for Wesley and Margaret Ann and Leonard and Angelo and Sharon and Linda, but it wasn't okay for me. I was curious. I wanted to live like Mr. Sigursky lived. I wanted the big car that he had. I wanted that big home that he had. We lived in a two bedroom apartment. It was seven of us plus mama. He had a big mansion, just three of them, 10,000 square feet. I said, Mama, what is it, Leslie? One day, I want to buy you something just like this. My brothers and sisters, when we were on the bus going back, they were just engaged in playful things. I was thinking and dreaming. Mama didn't understand why I was thinking like that, because I'd been exposed to positive messages. I had to take care of Mr. Sadursky. I had to shine his shoes and clean his office. And every day when he was listening to motivational messages, I was hearing those things too. Earl Nightingale, we become what we think about. All of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. In order to be successful, you must be willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. Your mind is a machine. You must program yourself for success. Wow. When I heard those words, I said, wait a minute. I can program my mind for success? I can program my mind for wealth? You can too. Trust me, I've earned over $55 million in the last 28 years. Anybody told me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now? I spoke recently in Sweden. They paid me 40,000 euro for an hour speech. I had no idea that this Les Brown that you now see had the ability to do that. I used to work for the Miami Sanitation Department as a garbage collector. I used to be a janitor. I used to do door-to-door -door sales. I used to work for Sears in Miami on Biscayne Boulevard. I had no idea this Les Brown that you now see had the ability one day to give lectures at Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth University. I had no idea that this Les Brown existed. I don't tell you that to impress you, but to impress upon you. There is more in you, Simba, there's more in you than you have been expressing. All of us have seen Lion King, some great symbols in there. And I say to you, there's more in you right now that's represented in your bank account. There's more in you right now that's being reflected by your life right now. Your life is not a true reflection of your potential. You have greatness within you. 
You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. There's a reason that my favorite book says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And as he continues to think, so he remains. In order for us to begin to break into that level of greatness that we have within ourselves, you have to make a conscious choice every day to expose your mind to positive messages. So I put myself on a regimen. I do this every day and I suggest that you do it. Write this down. Number one, listen to motivational messages every day. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. What it will begin to do is interrupt the story in your mind. It will override the story that you believe about yourself. It will distract all the negative thoughts that you have that's holding you back, that held me back for 14 years. When I used to go see the number one motivational speaker on the planet, Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins, and, and my heart said, I can do that. I love to help people. I'm just like my mother. And then my mind would ask, how? And I went from my heart to my mind. And my mind would say, Les Brown, you don't have a college education. Les Brown, you've never worked for a major corporation. Les Brown, you were labeled educable mental retarded. They call you DT, the dumb twin. You're not as smart as your brother. Have you ever thought about something you wanted to do and you convinced yourself that you couldn't do it? See, sometimes we need to have some external voices. And so by listening to motivational messages, that began to override the negative thoughts that I had about myself in my mind. And it gave me a new story and empowered me and gave me a vision of myself beyond my circumstances and mental conditioning and started me to writing a new chapter in my life. And so now, money will never be another issue for me. And that was an issue for most of my life because I did know what I did know and I thought I knew. So one you have to do is that you have to have a mindset development strategy where you are deliberately taking an hour every day listening to a motivational message. Every day, here's something else. Read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. Why? And read it with conviction and, and stay focused. 10 to 15 pages every day. This is seven days a week? Absolutely, absolutely. Every day, McDonald's know that you know where they are. Burger King know that you know where they are. But every day they have some advertising, they have billboards, they have radio, they have television. Why? Because by exposing you to those messages, that will begin to impact your behavior. It will drive you into the place to purchase what they're advertising. Now you're advertising for your greatness. And faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So you want to listen to positive messages every day. You do this, I'm telling you, your life will never be the same again. And read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. I read two to three books a week. Why? Because I have goals and dreams of things I want to achieve. I want my life to count. I want to make a greater impact. At this stage of my life, I'm working on my children's 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 education. A good man leaves a legacy for his children's children. So I'm working on their education at this point in my life. And as I begin to look at myself in order to achieve more and to do more, I know I have to work more on my mind. And let me give you an example of how this works. The most money I've ever earned in an hour and a half, $260,000. That's the most money I've ever earned in an hour and a half. A lot of people work a whole month and don't do that, or six months. Then, and this is the next thing I want you to do. I want you to look at your relationships and I want you to upgrade your relationships. See, MIT did a study. This study indicated that you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. Not only did I start reading books every day and listening to positive messages, but I separated myself from my friends who did not have goals and who did not have dreams. Why? Because people rub off on you. It's called a mind virus. You earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. So when you upgrade your relationships, you got to ask yourself the question, who is it that I need to associate with that I can learn from, that I can grow mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially? By aligning myself with another person that I can learn from, and Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. Whoa, think about that. I was the smartest one in my group. Then one person called me who had been admiring me for years and said, Les, I, I want you to coach me and my trainers on how to tell a story and create value for an audience. And I want to share with you some things. I want to teach you some things, old man. I said, is that right? He said, yes. You always say you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. I want to teach you some things. I said, okay, I'm open to that. Now, let me share this with you. He blew my mind. The most money, as I mentioned to you, I've ever earned speaking to over 8,000 people in Salt Lake City, Utah, $260,000. I did an event with this individual, just over 500 people, because of what I learned from him, because I upgraded my relationships, 
I earned over four hundred and ten thousand dollars in an hour and a half. I was excited, but I was also depressed because I've been speaking for twenty-eight years, and I start thinking about all the money that I left on the table, all the hotels. Plane rides, all of the audiences I spoke to, all of the money that I missed out on because I didn't know that I didn't know, and I thought I knew. I was a big fish in a small pond. I can't tell you if you don't get anything else, you have to look at your relationships and you've got to ask yourself the question: What is this relationship doing to me? And I mean, in every area of your life, when the doctor looked at me and said, "You have cancer." Cancer is the most feared word in seven different languages. One of the first things I had to do, I found out who had cancer at some point in time or was living with cancer and conquered it. I surrounded myself with people who had done what I wanted to do, who were winning at the game. See, it's it's very important every area of your life. If you want to improve your health, start hanging around healthy people. They did a a, a 30-year study and said that the reason that most people are obese it's a mind virus. Listen to what they said: a mind virus is communicated mind to mind. That if you have a friend that's fat or you marry somebody that's obese, you have a 41% to up to 161% of becoming obese yourself, even if they live in another state. Whoa! Why? Because birds of a feather flock together. Never forget, high school teacher Mr. Leroy Washington said, "Mr. Brown, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll become number ten." Whoa! Think about that. Part of your mindset development: not only listening, not only reading, but you have got to look at your relationships. Upgrade your relationships and continue to evaluate them and make sure they're an asset to you and not a liability. My son John Leslie is a motivational speaker. He has a saying: "Who should you count on, and who should you count out?" See, there's some relationships that can start out real positive, and then sometimes we outgrow people. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever outgrown someone? Somebody you used to be close to, used to be your bosom buddy, and then you haven't been together for a time, and then when you get together. You have absolutely nothing in common. Sometimes that happens with family members. My twin brother. It's a strange conversation because he's talking about Les. Did you hear who died? No, I don't get up reading the obituary column. I'm glad my name is not there. Hello, I don't care. I'm focusing on living. Our conversations are so different. Isn't it interesting how you could be raised in the same family? Same circumstances by the same parents and end up dramatically different. It's called life.